Deploying blob storage. All right, we're convinced. We're going to build a web application, maybe a social media site. And part of that is we want our users to be able to upload an image of themselves, maybe for a profile picture or some certain or some reason. And we need that to be stored on cheap, affordable, scalable storage. Blob storage is the winner. Luckily for us, with an Azure backend, it's incredibly easy to deploy blob storage. You just deploy a storage account, essentially. So getting started, I'm on the portal right here, and we're ready to deploy blob storage. I'll go to storage accounts on the left-hand side. We're just going to add a new storage account real quick. The resource group, I'm going to put this in my app dev resource group, but you can create a new one if you need to. Storage account names have to be all lowercase. So in this case, I'm going to call this Knox's blob storage, something simple like that. We'll wait for the green check mark, and sure enough, I've got a green check mark. I am going to put this in the central US, so I've got the nice quick latency. We have to choose a performance tier of standard versus premium. And the gist of it is, is that standard is backed by magnetic disk, premium is backed by so solid state drives. I'll leave it on standard because, you know, this is just a demo and it doesn't particularly matter. We've got the general purpose kind of storage, or we could specify blob only storage if we wanted to. But with general purpose, it leaves us flexible to using other things like file storage, queues, and tables. Replication, I'll leave this as geo redundant and on hot tier, but you could change those as well. We'll click review and create, and then we'll create the storage count. After 22 seconds, the storage account is created. Let's click on it to go into it and take a look at what we got. Well, there's blobs right there. We've also got the files, tables, and queues, like we said, but blob storage is what we're here for after all. So let's click on blobs, and this is where we can go to create our container. Just to go ahead and get a container created, I'll click the plus container. I'll call this my hyphen CBT hyphen nuggets hyphen container. Sure enough, got the green check mark. The public access level. This is where we can set who is able to view our data. Basically, is this going to be private where they have to be authenticated by Azure in order to get to it? Or is it going to be public? When we choose blob, we're specifying that any anonymous user can access blobs directly. When we choose container, we're saying that any anonymous user can actually browse through the container and choose blobs directly. So in this particular case, I'll just choose read access for blobs only. We'll click OK. And that's it. That's all there is to deploying a container. If you actually click in the container itself, you can very quickly change the access level if you need to, or we can go ahead and start uploading blobs. You see, they don't call them files now. They call them blobs. Files are in file storage. So we'll choose upload just to demo how easy it is to upload a file. We'll choose a folder. We'll scroll on down and just randomly choose... Something like the fuzzy grouping CSV that came from the SSIS course. Here we go. We'll click open there and we'll choose upload. And just like that, it is uploaded that quickly. I'll go ahead and just close out the upload pane. We'll click on the fuzzy grouping CSV itself. And you can see a few things here. We've got the ability to refresh the metadata that is already on this particular object. For instance, if we wanted to actually add some items to it, we could then use the REST API call to get info about this particular blob. We have the ability to view snapshots of the blob if we need to take snapshots, which is pretty cool. You can create those snapshots right there, restore back to a different time if the blob has been overwritten. Editing the blob itself, you can actually view the underlying data itself. Since this is a CSV, we're looking at CSV data. And shared access signatures, or SAS, are a way that we can control who can access this particular blob, what they can do with it, and for how long they can do that. Now, we're going to talk about shared access signatures in just a second, a little bit more, but let me hop back to the overview real quick, and we'll talk about leases. So in this particular case, we have a blob, and our application is going to be a big, globally distributed application. And if we have multiple people trying to access this blob at the same time, we may have a concurrency issue, meaning one person tries to upload one version of a file into this blob, and another person tries to upload another version of this file into the blob. And then maybe another person is editing the metadata and so on. We're going to get all of these conflicting problems. And what ends up happening is the last person to edit it, they win. So what we can do is we can actually acquire a lease to this blob and it shuts everybody else out so that you can edit your blob one at a time because you're the only person who has acquired a lease to edit this blob. So that's what leasing does. And we're going to talk about that more in a later nugget, but that's introducing the concept of it. Now let's hop back over to the overview real quick. 
And let's scroll on down and talk a little bit more about shared access signatures because this is a big deal. When we're talking about who is able to edit data and when, we're talking about who can actually connect to the storage account and make specific changes. You may only want to temporarily provision access to this blob storage using a shared access signature. So maybe John Doe is going to come along and they're going to need half an hour's worth of activity within this particular blob storage account, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncheck file, queue, and table and just and leave the allowed service under blob and show what they're allowed to access. They're allowed to access the service, the container, and the objects themselves. And here's the actions they're allowed to perform. We can then specify when they're allowed to perform these actions and what protocol they're allowed to access by. You can even whitelist the IP that they're allowed to do this from. Once you have all of these configurations ready to rock and roll, you simply click the generate button and it generates a custom connection string and token that they can use to log in and make their changes. And once that time frame is up, that's it. The shared access signature tokens and connection strings, they become obsolete after that. So that's how quickly you can get started deploying blob storage and what kind of configurations you can make in order to access it, as well as how to manipulate the blobs themselves. In the next few nuggets, we're going to be deploying an application to connect to this blob storage. We're going to get started by uploading files into it. Then we're going to list those files. And then we're going to make those files downloadable. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.